Oh, Father, we come to you tonight, and we worship you and give you thanks, and uh, we love you, Lord. We worship you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for all that you do for us, for your protection around us, for the provision you always give to us, for your touch, Lord, upon each and every life. And, Father, as we begin this study tonight, um, may we clear our minds and concerns uh, from our hearts and the concern that we just focus on you tonight for you Lord are uh, above all and we just want to give you our full attention and to your word speak to our uh, hearts give us understanding and, and uh, Father as we uh, remember those for prayer tonight I know there's many concerns on people's hearts maybe we don't verbalize them because there's so many lives that we see that need a touch from you but Lord for Richard and Kim the situation is I just don't understand Lord I don't understand it and where Richard is thinking but I pray Lord that you would protect them that you would speak to his heart in his mind Lord to make him understand that some things he can't do it all pray for Kim and when you look at her and you know that she into her eyes and know that their that mind is not there Lord and Lord she, it, it would be such a struggle so I pray Lord that you protect them that you uh, help them to see common sense help Richard to see where what needs to be Lord but I pray Lord and I know and we believe in miracles and know you can touch each and every one of us you can touch her and make her whole you can touch Richard in a complete healing and we know that because we've seen it we've seen you work in lives and, and touch and, and miracles are there Lord we know it but according to the, your will Lord is what we ask we pray for this project Veritas that you would protect this group that and it uh, help them Lord to be able to continue to expose the truth and we pray Lord for our enemies and know that we're to pray for them because Lord nobody is beyond your grasp so we pray for those that come against this uh, country against other countries against Israel we pray for them Lord because you are mighty and we know Lord that oh, it just takes one touch of your hand one sweep of it and you can change it all but Lord we do know that you will protect us you are with us and as I spoke to a little lady the other day and she has to have that leg amputated for her but she says you know Cindy I know Jesus is with me oh, and you will walk with me and I said absolutely and knowing that uh, you're doing a work in lives all over Lord we just have to open our eyes and open our hearts to see it so be with us tonight as we do study this word let us forget the business and concerns of everything going on around us we pray for our enemies and we pray for the righteous will stand tall and firm we thank you father and in Jesus name we pray amen amen thank you Cindy um, you know as we get ready to get into the word uh, I just want us to to uh, you know, I understand that we get together on Thursdays or whatever other days of the week that you all go to church or get together with other Bible study groups, you know, to encourage our hearts and to get before the Lord that he would strengthen us and help us in these last days, brethren, because it is so important for us to be familiar with the word of God. I mean, to really know the word and to make a stand and stand up for righteousness sake and it's not going to get easier it's going to get more and more difficult with the passing of time and uh, so we're going to need to grow in grace we're going to need all the grace that we can possibly get from the Lord and uh, so that this is what we're doing familiarizing ourselves being reminded of the things that we already know but reinforcing all these things so we're Back in the scroll, we're in number 75, Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Behold, my mother and my brethren. So, Ken, are you going to read then? Uh, no, I changed my mind. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. 
Well, if you get tired, honey, I'll help you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'm going to have you start right there, and we'll just read through that particular section, and then we'll go to my notes. While he had talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my, of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Okay, and then let me go to... Um, <clears throat> uh, I've already written, written out there, but if you'll read that, it's not that we. It's not that we don't love our earthly family, but now having been born again and adopted into the family of God, Ephesians 1.5, the love of God we share is greater. We prefer to be in the company of those who desire to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. This desire should serve to prove that the grace of God is working in a person's heart. You know, and <clears throat> to elaborate on that, uh, what, what I have come to, to find out, I mean, from, from the very beginning when I first got saved, I was just, uh, I had a love in my heart for the brethren. And it was a greater love than I had for my earthly family. It, doesn't, it didn't mean that I didn't love my earthly family. And I wanted the best for them. <clears throat> and I still continue to have that. But honestly... I prefer to be in the company of those that want to do the will of God. I prefer to be with those people, spend time with those people than I do with my earthly family. It's not that I don't love my earthly family, but the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost is greater. You know, uh, you know, it's that Psalms 134, I think it is. You know, behold how good it is, you know, to, to, oh, I forget how it goes now. There's a song that we sing on it, but, uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's the song. It, it's just a blessedness that we share as being adopted into the family of God that people that aren't part of this family the family of God, will never understand until they become a part of it. And what I would like us to, 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 to understand is that that desire does, it should serve to prove that the grace of God is working in a person's heart. For example, before you were ever saved, how much time did you want to spend with real Christians? I mean, did you wake up in the morning and say, Oh, man, I just think I'm going down to that place where all the Christians hang out. I want to spend the day with them and talk about the Word of God and the good goodness of God. Never. That never happened. So the fact that these desires are in our hearts should serve to prove to anyone who might be doubting. I say this because over the years, I have had people, actually Christians, say to me, well, how can I know for sure that God is working in my life? I mean, sometimes because we all walk through dry places. We all get tested. We all get have to go through the wilderness. So I've had people say, well, how can I know? And I point to them as such things as that. You know, the fact that we desire to have fellowship with other believers. Now, if as a Christian, you desire to have companionship with the world, and the world's ways, then you got a serious issue. And here's a scripture. I can't remember exactly where it is, but I think it's in Proverbs. I just can't remember which one. But it goes like this. It says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And, you know, if, if a Christian begins to desire the old ways and the old, you know, companionships, and there's a serious issue there. And you should know that the grace of God is being compromised in your heart if you find yourself in that, with that, you know, that going on in your heart. Because, like Jesus said, Behold my mother and my brethren, whosoever shall do the will of the Father, the same is my brother, sister, and mother. That 
we value that above all other relationships. Anybody want to add anything more before we go on? Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to the scroll here, and uh, it's going to be Mark 4, 1 through 9, and we're for time's sake, we're only going to read Mark's portion here, but you all remember how the, this works. You go with the arrows to the right or the left, and you can go to Matthew 13, 1 through 9, and Luke 8, 4 through 8, because they're <clears throat> pretty much covering the same thing. Okay, if you read that, Ken. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude by the sea on the was by the sea on the land. And he taught them with many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yield no, yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprung up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears, let him hear. Now we could continue reading because obviously he's going to keep talking about this parable, but just for the sake of breaking it up and going through the notes, let's just go to, like on, on the scroll here, we're going to break up. So this is 76, Parable of the Sower. Let me go to the notes here. And if, you'll, if you're up to reading here, if you'll pick up, let me point. Let me point out that among the four categories of persons the sower sowed, there was only one group that did not show some form of growth, those who fell by the wayside. All the others received the word and exhibited some, some growth. I say this because the Calvinist wants us to believe that only that fell, those that fell on good ground were saved. But you cannot be withered unless you begin to grow, meaning you abide in the vine. John 4, 15, 4 through 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bring forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Jesus stated that if a person does not abide in him, he will wither, which means that this person, branch, had to be given growth by receiving nourishment from the vine in order to be withered. But they were a branch, but they were a branch, a part of the vine. John 15, 6. If a man abide not in me, he casts forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The point that I'm making here is that, you know, we just read where that that fell on stony ground, it, you know, it had no root, and it withered. Well, in order for something to wither, it, it has to have had life. And the only way that you can get life is to be part of the vine. And the only way you can get nourishment to, to be able to get to the point where you could wither is you have to be part, you have to be a branch. You may not have brought forth fruit, but you had to have been a branch. And let me say this, brethren, that the only people that could be classified as being a branch of the vine are those that come to Jesus. Not the whole, the whole world is, people in the world are not branches of the vine. You have to abide in Christ. Okay, so in order to wither, you have to be getting nourishment from the vine. That's why I've gone to John 15 to bring out these things. So he says, if a man doesn't abide in me, he's cast forth of the branch and is withered. So it's up to you whether you want to abide in the branch or not. Let's, if you'll pick it up and notice. Notice that those who fell on stony ground had to have, had to have become part of the vine because these who fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up. So Jesus said that immediately it sprang up. There had to be growth, nourishment for them to spring up. 
And we know this is indisputable because Jesus said this is about those who fell on stony ground. Mark 4, 6, But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Again, so understand that that which fell on stony ground, even though it didn't, you know, it, it fell away, it did spring up. Well, how do you spring up and say that you're, you, you didn't get saved? You know, there's growth there. It, it's, it got life. Until you get born again, you don't have life. You're dead in your sins. You don't have this spiritual life. But here, it fell on stony ground, and immediately it sprang up. And then, because it had no root, it withered away. Okay, uh, let's keep reading here, if you would, Ken. Although it says it had no root, his root was not deep and well attached, but certainly he was receiving nutrient from the vine in order to have withered away. And in the next section where Jesus explains the parable in greater depth to the disciples, we shall see even more proof that these who fell on stony ground were indeed saved, a part of the vine. But those who fell among the thorns also had been in the vine because they had nourishment, life, flowing from the vine. Otherwise, how could they have been described as choked? But let's look at the fourth group who did bring forth fruit. These, just like those who fell on stony ground, sprang up, but the stony ground ones withered away before they brought forth fruit. Okay, so let's look at those particular groups. So the ones that fell on stony ground, it says they sprang up. Those that fell among thorns, it says that they were, that the word was choked. I mean, in other words, you know, they were trying, they, they, they were trying to, to live. Have you, ever, have you ever found yourself choking at any time? I'm sure all of us experienced it. There's a desperation, right, because you want to live. And so, but what happened with them is that, you know, nobody was there to perform the Heimlich maneuver on them. And because they got caught up with, the cares and the riches uh, of this life, it choked the life that they had received, okay? And then the, those that fell on good ground, it also says that they sprang up. But the difference between the stony ground and the sprang up is that the good ground ones, they brought forth fruit. The stony ground, it withered away. But they, again, they were both in, do you need my help? Okay. I have to take a break for a second, guys. Okay. I don't know. How, how, what do you want me to do here? I wish you would have waited. Okay, now what? Okay, now I'm here. Okay, um, anyone want to add anything before we go on? Okay. All right, let's go back to the scroll to number 77, Matthew 13, <coughs> and through 23. Okay, this is where Jesus is going to continue to talk about the parable. Can you and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto him? And to them in parables. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But to whoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak to them, I speak to them in parables, because they seeing not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, 
and shall not perceive. But for this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for you see, and your ears, for you, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and that have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, they cometh, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the, way, by the wayside. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received the seed of the, unto the good grounds is he that heareth the word, understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Now, there are a lot of things that I could have discussed here, but I just tried to go with what the Lord seemed to emphasize in my heart. I do want to uh, make a point that that what really boils down to, if you want to know what it really boils down to between being good, you know, on good ground and the others, it's that they put a relationship with the Lord as the primary thing. Uh, you know, the those that fall on the court, those that fall by the wayside, I mean, we hardly need to discuss them. We understand that's the overwhelming majority of people. The ones that fall in stony places, they value their own life more than they do this relationship with the living God. And look, we understand that self-preservation is a strong thing that God has put in our hearts for a reason, obviously. But what I would say is that when you really love the Lord, it's like, and you come to believe in him, that becomes the primary thing in your life. And, uh, and then for, for those that fall amongst the thorns, again, their, their, their hearts are, are about the things of this world and this life. And, you know, Paul said that if our hope is in this life alone, we're of all men most miserable because the Lord doesn't want us having all our hopes uh, revolving around the things of this life. They're all temporary. I mean, he's made it perfectly clear that we're not going to be allowed to take anything with us, but we are going to have to exit this world no matter what. And so with that in mind, why would we spend so much of our time and labor for those things that are going to perish. That's what Jesus said. You know, but let's go over to the notes here and try to concentrate on things that the Lord has put in. Okay, can you start? Why does? Why does Jesus need to explain the parable to the disciples? Because as we all have learned and continue to learn, is that the word will always reveal a deeper meaning to us. Matthew 13, 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. The world, the unsaved, cannot receive the understanding of God unless you have been born again and have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. That is, you have received the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. You are incapable of comprehending. Compre comprehending. Now, 1 Corinthians 2:14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So this goes along with how we started this tonight, the theme, that, you know, who are those that, that I esteem as my mother, my brother, you know, my family? It's those that love the will of God, want to do the will of God, who love the Word 
who want the understanding of God, who want the knowledge of God, the love of the knowledge of God, the love of the truth. And the world can't, they, they, it, they, it, they are incapable of comprehending these things. Why should we spend our time with those people that, that, that don't value the things that we know are of the utmost value? You know, so the, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to, unto him. And, you know, over the years, I, I've seen Christians where I, I, I noticed how some of them over time want to start spending more time with unsaved people. And, you know, they, they tell me, well, you know, we're, we're trying to minister to them, but there's more to it than just that. And that, that's not to say that we're not to spend time ministering to the lost. Don't, don't get me wrong here. But there's, there's a difference in that we don't want to partake in the works of darkness. We are to reprove them. And if you start reproving the works of darkness, they're not going to want you hanging around with them. That's just the way it works. You know, so I, I, I notice that sometimes Christians, like, well, we, we don't want to offend them because, because then they, they, they won't hear us at all. I mean, you know, brethren, let's be wise. You know, gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. Let's put the will of God first. Let's put our relationship with the living God first above any earthly relationships. It, it's it's really important. Anybody want to add anything before we go on? Okay, if you'll, we're, we're still talking about the same things that we just read about. So if you'll go and read this next portion here, Ken. Uh, obviously, or we already read verse twelve. So if you just pick up on the note, obviously. Obviously, something <clears throat> shall be taken away, even that he hath. If Jesus is talking about the world, what does the world have that can be taken away? But if Jesus is talking about those who receive the seeds, such as he hath, that hath received the seed on stony places, and he also that hath received the seed by the thorns, then we can understand what shall be taken away. So look, when we look at this verse 12, whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Read it in context with the parable. Why would Jesus just throw this into the parable if it didn't have to do with what he's talking about? So what is it that shall be taken away even that he hath? And, of course, this flies in the face of Calvinism because Calvinism says, oh, no, no. You know, if, if you can't, once you get saved, it can never be taken away from you. And I'm just going with what Jesus is talking about here in the parable of the sower. And so what is it? that can be taken away. I, I just leave for you to figure that out. If it's not the fact that they've gotten life, that they've received the life of the Spirit, and uh, then what is it? I'll leave that for you to determine. But for me, I, I, I know what it is. You know, those that received in the stony places and those that received amongst the thorns, it's taken away what, what they had, the light that was given to them. Okay, and then I guess you go ahead and read verse 20 again, and then, and then the, uh, the note, if you would, Ken. But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it. Notice he that received the seed into stony places, that his reaction was that anon with joy received it. Only those who get saved experience joy upon receiving the word. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The lost don't receive the word with joy. They reject it, often mocking and scorning. So look, I'm just asking you. Again, the Calvinist says, oh, no, the people in Stony Place, they never got saved. But it says here that anon with joy they received it. Well, honestly, tell me who in the world, of all the people that you've interacted with, that are unsaved in the world, how many of them, when you talk with them about the Word of God, are joyful and rejoice about it? I would say none. I never rejoiced when, when I wasn't saved. I mean, I was curious. 
I would listen, but I never exhibited joy until the night that I got saved. And then it was joy unspeakable and full of glory. <clears throat> it's, it's a fruit of the Spirit of God, this joy that we're talking about. And we're not talking about the joy of worldly, you know, uh, uh, things. We're, we're talking about the joy that comes from the Spirit of God. So anon with joy, he receiveth it. I think that when, when I talked earlier about that, when we get down into the parable, the explanation of it, we'll see that there's, it's obvious that these people on stony ground receive the Lord because of the joy they experience. Only the, those who've gotten saved can, can say that. Okay. Uh, let's go on to 23. But he that received the seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some hundred fold, some sixty, some thirty. I want us to really look at, at those on good ground here and think about the hundred, the sixty, and the thirty. And let's just look at what the Lord put in my heart here. If you'll read at notice. Notice that those that fell on good ground also sprang up, just as those who fell on stony ground. But those who fell on good ground increased. They grew and brought forth fruit. But although there were different levels of production, some 30, some 60, some 100, they are all considered as those who fell on good ground. We should never compare ourselves with ourselves. 2 Corinthians 10:12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So listen, I think you understand where I'm going with this. Some 30, some 60, some 100. And, you know, the carnal mind tends to think, oh, well, yeah, the one that's 100, they're, they're, they're obviously more special. And, you know, God... How does God categorize them? They're categorized all the same. They're all those that fell on good ground, whether they brought forth 30, 60, or 100. They all fell on good ground. Bear that in mind. Okay, if you'll pick it up with me, we may not. We not, may not bring forth as much as someone else, but we are still those who fell on good ground. We all don't have the same calling and outwardly may appear to be less productive, but as long as we all obey and do the will of God, we shall receive the same reward. As the parable in Matthew 20 explains, some worked longer hours just as some had come to know the Lord sooner and have labored longer. But in the end, we all receive the same reward as long as we fulfill the will of the Master who we agreed to labor for. Matthew 20, 8 through 16. So when even, even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us which have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do not you know, do thee no wrong. Didst now agree with me for a penny? Take thine, take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many be called, but few chosen. So, again, this idea that, you know, 30, 60, 100, that, oh, well, the, hundred, the one that did the 100 are more valuable to the Lord. God loves them more because, I mean, 100 versus 30. But who's to say why one had 30 or 60 versus 100? Did they start laboring? Did they labor longer in the vineyard? Did they get saved earlier in life, uh, you know, or did one get saved later in life? Does that, you know, think about this. And there's other factors to it as well. Okay, if you'll pick it up at those who produce. 
Those who produce 30 are not loved in this who produce 100. Produce according to the grace given to us. 1 Corinthians 3, 5-10. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth any, anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now that he, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own ward according to his, his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon, but let man take heed on how he buildeth thereupon. Okay, so look, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, Paul said. You know, I, I build, but we have to be take heed how we build. You know, in other words, study to show yourself approved. Find out how God wants you to build on the foundation. Because if you build wrong, it's not going to be God's fault. Again, remember, it's on us to study to show ourselves approved. That's an important you hear me stress this all the time because I just realize how little that is impressed upon people. And so I'm going to press that on. Uh, but then again, it, it's bringing into understanding about 30, 60, and 100. It's not that, oh, wow, the 100 is love more or God, you know. It, it, all, it all depends on what God has called you to. Okay, let's, if you'll keep going here, Ken. What shall be our reward according to his own labor? It will be the penny we agreed upon. Although we will be worth far greater than any penny, it will be the Lord himself. Genesis 15.1 After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. We shall have the fountain of living waters, the Lord, who shall satisfy every longing in our hearts. We shall spend eternity with the greatest artist, the greatest musician, the greatest author, the almighty creator, and what greater reward can there be? Honestly, brethren, I mean, you know, I, I don't hear it that much anymore, but I, year, years ago I, I would hear people talking about, man, I, when I get to heaven, I'm, I'm planning, on, I hope I have the biggest mansion, I hope I have this, I have, and it's like, my goodness, you're, what what you know you're looking at things people looking at heaven through carnal eyes i mean what greater reward is there than what god said to abraham he says i am thy exceeding great reward i want you to understand that i want you to value me and i say that he's 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 the greatest artist the greatest musician the, the greatest of everything is the creator who has made all things. You know, I once heard a guitar player. Uh, they were interviewing. And they said, you know, we, we, it is said that you play music from another very well accomplished guitar player better than he played it. And the guy re responded by saying, well, you know, the problem is, is that that guitar player is an innovator and I'm just an imitator and I thought that was such a profound saying oh some somebody's banging stuff in the background uh, mute yourself so that it doesn't come through um, so he said that guitar player is an innovator I'm just an imitator and the truth of it is is that our creator is the is the ultimate innovator and we're all just imitators of of the things that he's given and so the idea brethren that there would be a greater reward in heaven than being able to spend time with our creator is just we'd be we'd be missing the boat and uh, what what i just find so amazing is that he has promised us to share all things with us. Everything that he has, everything that he is, he is going to share that with us. How 
What more could we possibly want? I just long for that day. The sooner the better. Come, Lord Jesus. Okay, we're going to go to Mark 4 in, in the number 78 in the scroll. If you'll read that, Kent, please. And he saith unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither had, was anything kept secret, but that it should become come broad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he saith unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. So, you that hear shall more be given. I mean, that is a, that, that's a big deal there. But what does that mean? Uh, again, it gets back to study to show yourself approved. Uh, because the more that you hear, the more you understand, the more the Lord is going to give you. Because it's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. But you got to start. you you got to start somewhere. You got to start building on the foundation. And, you know, be careful how you build, but if you build right, more will be given to you. Unto you that hear, in other words, unto you that are instructed as you study and you begin to build right, more will be given to you. All right, let's go to our my notes here. And um, if you'll pick it up, at, we should know. Oh, I'm sorry, here. Uh, did I? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, right there, that we should. We already read 21, 22. We should know that the true motivations of every man's heart will be revealed. Everything will be uncovered when we stand before the Lord, Romans 2, 16. In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, now, the reason I'm saying that is because Jesus said nothing's going to be hid. It's all going to be manifested. And anything, you know, that was kept secret, it's, it's going to be, you know, laid out bare for everyone to see. And, uh, again, this is like be careful how you build on the foundation. Make sure that your motivations, that your motives are right. Allow the grace of God to purify you. We all need purification. Let's not kid ourselves. All of us need purification. Right till the end, we're going to need to have our motives. We have to guard our hearts, and we can only do it by the grace of God, by looking into the Word and allowing the Word, the Holy Ghost, to deal with us and purify our hearts. So he's going to judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ on the last day. Okay, and if you'll continue here, though, here's the wonderful thing. But if men acknowledge his sin now and repent by putting away their evil ways, this is the promise God has made to them in the new covenant, Hebrews 8, 10 through 13. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now, now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Why would I want to serve God under the old covenant, which waxeth old and is ready to vanish away, when under the new covenant he has promised that he's not our sins and our iniquities, he's not going to remember anymore. So that means that on the last day, when God is going to judge the secrets of men, we won't need to. Why? Because he's been purging us all along. He's been showing us where we need to be, our hearts need to be purified. And we, because we're living and walking in repentance, are adjusting our lives. And so in that day, he, God is not going to need to reveal our secrets because 
He's been purifying us. He's our sins and iniquities he won't remember anymore. Just remember what Jesus said to Peter. You know, Peter says, how often must I forgive my brother? And Jesus said, if he repent. Remember that. If he repents, you forgive him seven times 70 in a day. But it's all depending on if he repents. That means if he's willing to adjust his life and not continue, yes, forgive. And that's what God, that's the deal the Lord has made with us. That if we'll repent and believe the gospel, he will not remember our sins and iniquities. But if we continue to practice sin, he will remember our sins and iniquities. And he will reveal the secrets of our, our hearts in that day. But if we live according to the, the covenant, the new covenant, our sins and iniquities will he remember no more. Okay, if you'll pick it up here, like in the explanation. Here, like in the explanation of the parable of the sower that we covered before, Jesus warns us, take heed what you hear. We should understand that this is our personal responsibility to make the effort to understand, meaning we need to seek the Lord for that we under, for that understanding and not look to the latest book or upcoming ministry. I mean, look, brethren, I understand that particularly as young believers, we feel inadequate within our ability to make sense of everything in the Word of God because this is the way the Lord has, has made it. He's not going to teach you. He's not going to give you everything. He says that the him that has shall be shall more be given. So he's letting you know that, you know, you're going to be given a little bit at a time. And as you show him that you want it, he'll reveal more to you. But look, let's not think that, you know, by reading the latest book or, you know, oh, this is what's happened over in this brother's ministry. And I mean, I, we've seen over the years Christians chasing this ministry and that ministry and this revival over here and that revival over there and they're missing the whole boat that God is right here wherever two or three are gathered in my name there shall I be in the midst oh but you know what we're not seeing the miracles like well then God just doesn't want to do the miracles amongst us right now can you accept that you think that just because you go to this ministry or that place that God is obligated to oh he's going to perform a miracle no he's he's with us he dwells in us you are the temple of the living god god says he'll he'll walk in them and he'll talk he'll be with us okay we're going to number 79 matthew 13 24 through 30. <clears throat> just read that one ken and another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath its tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in some time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into bundles to burn. Then but, then, but gather the wheat into my barn. So I'm going to take you to a little picture here to show you uh, a tear and the wheat. And you're going to see that they look very similar. And what I've read on it is that uh, the tares, they, their, their root system kind of gets tangled up with the wheat root system. And so if you pull them up, you're actually going to end up pulling up wheat. So it, it, this is all very accurate. Let me see if I can pull up this. Uh, um, okay, here we go. Okay, I hope I can. Can you all see that, that picture? Can you see it, Ken? Yeah. Okay, so here's That's the good. thing. Uh, the wheat, I believe, is on the right, 
and he explains it here. Let me see. Okay, uh, I I don't know exactly which one it is it now. But look at the look at the picture above, and particularly the middle, baby tear, yet a baby. Okay. When the wheat stalk looks exactly the same. In fact, they're indis, indis, indistinguishable. The only way to tell the difference is when they both mature in the spring. So the, okay. again, the one, the, the middle one, is a tear. Okay, right. So you see, they both kind of, you know, their coloration is a little different. The one on the right is when the wheat brings forth fruit. This, this, the tear doesn't ever look like that when it's mature. Only the wheat does. And I think the tear, when it's mature, it has little seeds. I think little black seeds in it. And, but the, the fact is, is that when you look at these two, I mean, the coloration might look, but growing together, it looked very similar, as you can see. Now, let me see. Okay, and so here's the difference between wheat, juvenile wheat, and the wheat that is come to full term and, and bears forth fruit. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go back here. Yeah, I'm sure as those as those are so close together, they're they're even twisting together at the bottom, not even in the ground system, but even on this, that's parts coming up, you probably have to twist and turn to unravel them. I would I would imagine, but I actually read that their root systems get intertangled, and yeah, so if, yeah, but, if, you know, yeah. and the only way to get rid of something is to pull out the roots. But if you pull out the roots of the tear, you're going to pull out some of the roots of the wheat. So that's why the Lord says, no, no, let them grow together until the harvest. So, all right, we just read 24 through 30. So if you'll pick it up here, although. That's why I let, let the red hairs and the gray hairs on my head go together. <laughs> I don't want to pull all my hair out. <laughs> well, trust me, if you're like me, they're, they're all going anyway naturally. Although this seems simple enough, we should understand that Jesus is letting us know the reality of his kingdom. First, we will have to deal with the enemy who will plant among us the counterfeit. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Second, wheat and tares look very much alike when they first come out of the ground. And it's not until they mature that you can tell them apart. Third, although it might, although it might seem that the tares will go unpunished, we know they will be burned. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Last, the wheat will be gathered together with Jesus, but not before long, not before being put into the, put to the test. Luke 3:17 whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into, the, into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So listen, brethren, the Lord knows them, you know, who are part of his kingdom. He, he knows, but he is going to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. We're not talking about the world. The world is not part of his kingdom. So who is he gathering out of his kingdom? It's the tares. It's the ones who, you know, started out right, but, you know, they, and of course, we can make the argument to Calvinists, made, well, a tear is a tear from the time it springs out of the ground. Well, that is true, but the point is this, is that how can you be part of his kingdom without having gotten saved? So you can make the argument about the tares, you know, but the point is, Matthew 13, 41 through 42, he's going to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. And so the world can't be a part of his kingdom. And uh, the fact that he's going to thoroughly purge his floor, brethren, we're going to be put to the test. And God has every right to test. What he is trying to determine is, who is it of those that, He's given life to in the world. Of all the numbers, who of those really want to spend eternity with him? They're not interested in riches. They're not interested in, you know, the carnal things. They're interested 
in him and having a relationship with him. He has the right to test everyone. He's the one who created us to that end, and he has the right to test us, and he's going to do it. He is going to thoroughly purge his floor. I don't mind being put to the test. And I can tell you that I have failed at times when he's put me to the test. But it's to my benefit that I might learn from it and that I might have my heart purified. And that is why I don't mind the test. I don't, you know, it's never pleasant, but I like what it produces. You know, that the, the chastening of the Lord for the time being is not pleasant, the Bible says, you know, in Hebrews 12. He said, but when you've been exercised thereby, it brings forth the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It produces what God wanted to, which is the wheat. So, you know, let God have his way in our hearts. I, I think to me that the idea that we're going to spend all eternity with the creator and that he's going to share everything that he has and that he is with us. My goodness, this little, this light affliction, as Paul referred to it in this life, this light affliction worketh the far more weight of glory. We've reached the nine o'clock hour, so we're, we're going to hold it off and then we'll pick it up at number 80, the mustard seed, next week. Uh, that's where we'll start in again. Although, actually, I think that's about the last thing that I had for tonight anyway. Maybe we go ahead and just cover that real quick. Um, let's just read it. Let's just cover it real quick, um, if you would, number 80 there. Another parable he put he forth to them, unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among the herbs and becomes a tree, becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Okay, that it seems like, why would the Lord be talking about that when he's talking about the sower of the seed and, the, you know, the good ground, the stony ground? And, well, let's look at my notes here. If you read that when the seed is first sown in our hearts, it may seem as the smallest of seeds, and then as it grows, we we serve to be a refuge of hope for others. Our lives become examples for others to be encouraged. So that's the thing. When when the seed first gets sown, it's like the mustard seed. It it says here it's the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it's the greatest among the herbs and becomes a tree. And the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches. How does that relate to us? Because when it's first sown in our heart, it, it's, you know, it seems we, we're discouraged. We think like, oh, my gosh, I'll never, I'll never be like Jesus. I, you know, you, it's so, but then we begin to grow. And then pretty soon, as, as time goes on, the, the more we grow, the stronger we get, the bigger we get in the Lord, the more our roots get deep. We become a refuge of hope for others. Our lives become examples for others to be encouraged. You know, the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of there looking for protection, looking for nourishment. People will see our lives. They'll be drawn to the light, and we can serve to point them to the true light. And with that, we're going to close tonight. Anybody want to add anything before we wrap it up tonight? Okay, hopefully everyone's awake. And All right, no one has anything they'd like to share before we close it up tonight. Just that scripture verse came to mind, Jesus learned through obedience and he was made perfect. Amen. You know, look, if Jesus had to learn obedience uh, through the things that he suffered, then we will too, you know, and honestly, it, we all suffer discouragement when we suffer. No, nobody, you know, but what we do like is what it ends up producing in us. And so as we get older in the Lord, you know, we, we learn how to embrace it. I don't think I'm ever going to love it. I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to say, oh, yeah, Lord, bring it on. I, I don't think so. 
<laughs> Maybe. I don't know, but I don't think so. But by the grace of God, I can say that through it all, it all works the good in us. All things work together for the good. So I, I'm so grateful that the Lord is, is doing this work in my heart, as I'm sure we all are. Anybody else want to add anything before we close it out tonight? Anything that's in your heart that the Lord has spoken to you? Or maybe a note that you covered that we haven't covered or that you want to elaborate on. I know so many of you think like, oh, well, I have something, but it's, uh, it's, it's never insignificant. It, if, if it's just a matter of showing the Lord that, Lord, here's what you gave me and I'm sharing it and you're going to get more from it. That, that's the way it works. Okay. And then again, I'm never going to twist anyone's arm. Crickets. You hear crickets. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I hear those all the time because I suffer from tinnitus. But, but thank God that, you know, I'm just happy that we can continue to get together. And brethren, I, I, I don't say this to discourage us, but ra rather to encourage us to dig in and let our roots get deep. There, there are troublesome days up ahead. I don't know how soon, but you, we can see the course that our nation is taking. And honestly, brethren, we are, our nation is the beacon of the world. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, it's not. What, yes, there's wickedness and everything. But look, we're still the nation that God has used to propagate the gospel the most in these end days. And uh, so... We see how bad things are getting in this country. You can imagine how, how, how bad it is in other countries. So let's prepare ourselves. Let's dig in. Let's let our roots get deep. Let's, let's that relationship with the Lord become the primary thing in our lives because it is the most important thing. And it's a thing that God values the most, and he wants us to value it the most. He truly does. For God so loved the world. He values that relationship so much that he gave his son to be able to restore that relationship. And we he wants us to value it just as much. All right. Uh, any last word? Otherwise, we're going to call on someone to close us in prayer tonight. Okay. Who has it in their heart to close us in prayer tonight? Anybody? Chano, you can do it even in French. The Lord speaks French. He understands French. <laughs> but I won't twist your arm. Anyone else like to close us in prayer? Chano, yes. Are you there? Yes, but okay. I twist my arm and I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the Lord is going to bless you, even if you can pray in English, but if you pray in French, the Lord will bless you anyway. Oh, okay. Well, I won't twist your arm too much harder. <laughs> I'd like to hear it. I'd like to hear it in French. It'd be beautiful. Oh, John O. So now it's not me twisting your arm. It's somebody else, John O. Okay, well, who who will take us? Oh, Jono, you're going to do it. Okay. Try to twist the arm of, of Michael. <laughs> oh, Michael. Oh, man, you're right. That The problem is I can't, I can't get close enough to him to twist that arm, to make him yield, to let, make him give up. <laughs> All right, no. Anybody, who, who will take us to the Lord in prayer and close us out tonight? Anyone? I'll close. All right, perfect, Ken. Lord, we just thank you, Father. We just come before you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, and thank you for your word, Lord, that uh, I pray that each and every one of us on this call and uh, that we reach out to other friends, family, members, uh, coworkers, Lord, to encourage them, uh, if they don't know the Lord, to be a, get a chance to witness to them. If they do know you, Lord, to also pray that and encourage them to put a hunger in their heart to study your word more each and every day and to learn more, Lord, uh, because that's where our strength, our hope, 
your promises. Uh, all, many, many promises are there to give us hope and guidance and direction. And, Lord, that we can stand and believe on those promises, uh, that everything that you say is true. For, God, you are not a liar. We thank you for this time you've given us. Uh, continue to bless everybody here. If there's any unspoken requests that didn't come forward tonight, forth tonight, Lord, we just ask you touch them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Uh, continue to pray for Kathy, uh, that her hand heals up. We pray that it's a good report that she gets back and uh, continue to bless her. We thank you for this time and just ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let me just end the um, recording here.